So the Ferrocell was invented by a guy named Tim Vanderelli. Now Tim Vanderelli, Vanderelli has a uh, company called Ferrocell USA and his website is www.ferrocell.us. Okay, and so on his website, he's got a section called pictures and movies of various experiments. And I just want to point this out because uh, my image, an image that I took that I sent him is featured on this page. It's actually the first image here on the left. And I don't know, I'm quite proud of that. And so, um, yeah, so Tim Vanderelli is the inventor of the Ferrocell. Here is his patent number, uh, magnetic flux viewer. His patent number is 8246356. And here is an abstract of his invention. It was filed April 12, 2007. And the date of patent, I'm assuming that means the date of the patent issue, was August 21st, 2012. So you can look that up yourself and read this abstract. Here is the ferrocell that I built. Now I think I probably showed this before in one of the other videos, but here it is again. Um, this uh, region here, this black part, is the housing for the light um, box or light uh, holder that holds all of the LEDs. These little dots here are the LEDs. And uh, my brother Mike 3D printed this for me and I wired it up myself. So the first time I did this, I did a terrible job. This is the second time. And unfortunately, I'm gonna have to wire it up again because I got one of my large magnets too close to these wires and it shorted out a bunch of the LEDs. And so um, my ferro cell is currently out of commission. So on this side, we have the ferro cell without the glass, without the um, two pieces of uh, optically uh, flat glass that is used to make the ferro cell. On the right here, the glass is in place. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the ferro cell that I made, where I made uh, this image here. Okay, and so you can see without the um, magnet in place, the ferro cell, which actually I just want to make this point that Tim Vanderelli is now calling this the ferro lens. Okay, the ferro cell is the product that he's selling, which is, I think, the light box as well as the glass and the ferro fluid in between. Uh, so he's calling this the ferro lens. So in his paper, he's going to call it the ferro lens, and when he sells it, he's going to call it the ferro cell. So I wanted to distinguish between those two things. Okay, so when you put a magnet under the ferro cell or near the ferro cell, then you start seeing these, these lines. Okay, so the light does something different when the magnet is there than when the magnet is not there. Okay, so, you know, we all know this. And the <clears throat> so here you see the north pole of the magnet. And here actually, <clears throat> excuse me, what you're seeing here are a bunch of magnets. Okay, these are actually cylinder magnets with little spacers between them. Okay, and this is the dielectric inertial plane. And because there's spacers between them, you see, you know, a little bit of strange bending going on in the middle. And this is the, uh, the north or south end uh, pole view of this stack of magnets. Now I wanna point something out that I thought was interesting. Uh, the um, magnets that I bought have a hole in them. Okay, so these are actually cylinder magnets with a hole in them. Now these are not, sorry, these are, these are not ring magnets. These are cylinder magnets with a hole in the middle. And so what you see here uh, is that this black region that you would normally see in a cylinder magnet, sorry, in a cylinder magnet, yes, in all the magnets, this hole here, which is right here, doesn't really, it's, it's as if it's there, it could be there or not there. Okay, so if this was a cylinder magnet, it would look the same as with the hole or without the hole. Now, in a ring magnet, you of course would see something in the middle here. You would see the light patterns again forming in the middle here, and they don't do that with this magnet. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. So here is another 
um, image that I showed you in a previous video. This is a two by one by two uh, neodymium magnet. Uh, and you see a very strong signal. This is the dielectric inertial plane. Okay, and this is a um, similar image here, only this is the cylinder magnet. In fact, this is two cylinder magnets that I put together, which basically makes it one magnet, because when you put two magnets together, north to south, uh, you get one magnet. And this is the dielectric inertial plane. And this is the image I showed you that shows how the um, iron filings um, line up orthogonal to the, these lines that form in the ferro cell. Now, the question is, what are these lines? What do these lines represent? Why are they there? Why does light behave this way um, under the ferro cell? Okay, and just uh, just one little uh, point I want to make here in my last video. I created a little bit of confusion. Actually, I was a little confused <clears throat> because of the um, difference in similarities between the uh, a coil of wire compared to a magnet under the ferro cell. And at the time, I was thinking that a coil of wire was behaving differently than a magnet under the ferro cell. And so uh, Tim Vanderelli cleared that up for me. He created these images for me. The image on the left is a um, cylinder, is a uh, coil of wire. Okay, this coil of wire of similar dimensions to the one on the right, which is a cylinder magnet. And uh, he wired this up in such a way that the field strengths were almost identical. He told me that this one was 25% less strong than the one on the right. And that's why this one is slightly dimmer. But as you can see, comparing apples to apples, which is what I wanted to do, the, um, the coil, uh, and of course this coil has an iron core in it, so it's very much like the permanent magnet, uh, has exactly the same uh, field lines or light patterns in, in under the ferro cell. So there is no difference between a coil and a magnet, at least a coil with an, with an iron core. Okay, they're almost identical. And so that cleared that up for me and I'm kind of happy that it did because now the universe makes sense again. Here is uh, an image I took, a couple images I took. This is one of the very first uh, images that I took of a ferro cell. This is a ferro cell that I actually bought from Tim Vanderelli um, a few years ago. And I just wanted to show you these two. Here's the uh, normal hypotrochoid pattern from the North or South Pole. And here I'm taking a picture a bit on the angle so you can see that holographic effect that, um, that you see that looks almost three-dimensional, even though it is just the light going through a very super thin layer of... Uh, the ferrofluid that is between two optically flat pieces of glass. So um, this video is going to be a little bit of a, a review of this paper, Observing Dynamical Systems Using Magneto-Controlled Diffraction. Now this is the key word here, diffraction, because in a, um, not in a previous video, but in a previous message in my community, I had asked you all to um, watch a video on diffraction grating and also on the double, double slit experiment because those two things are related. And so uh, that's an important concept to understand in order to really get the most out of the video that I'm making right now. Okay, so what is a ferrofluid? Okay, so the, the ferro cell is made um, taking by taking a few drops of the ferrofluid and mixing it with a, another medium such as mouse milk or WD-40 um, or some other lubricant uh, which basically thins it out and allows it to um, thin out very nicely between the two pieces of glass. So what is a ferrofluid? So I'm going to read this to you and then we'll go over it. So <clears throat> and so in the ferro cell, the light pattern observed in the ferro lens, right, 
is, is based on the idea that when a ferrofluid is placed in the presence of a magnetic field, it can interact with the light. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the interaction of the light with the ferrofluid that is in between the glass. The ferrofluid is a stable colloidal dispersion using a light mineral oil. Okay, and this is the um, type of ferrofluid that he uses, that Tim Vanderell uses, and this is the company that, that he bought it from. So this is the specification for the ferrofluid for the ferro lens. Okay, so it has a response time of around 200 milliseconds, uh, typically containing 5% of a magnetic solid, which I believe is magnetite, okay? A 10% of a surfactant, okay? I, it took me a while to figure out how to say that word. 10% of a surfactant and 85% of the carrier oil, or carrier, which is actually a um, mineral oil. The nanoparticles are spheres in the order of 10 nanometers. So 10 nanometers in diameter. And again, the carrier that they talk about here is mineral oil. So these are the two word, the, uh, two terms that I want to go over, the colloidal dispersion and the surf surfactant. But first we'll talk about the collo coil, uh, colloidal dispersion. A colloid is a solution that has particles ranging in between 1 and 1,000 nanometers in diameter. So the, um, the, you know, the magnetite uh, spheres are in that order. Okay. Yet, they are still able to remain evenly distributed throughout the solution. These are also known as colloidal dispersions because the substances remain dispersed and do not settle to the bottom of the container. Okay, so they, they, they uh, remain dispersed, nicely spaced out in the medium, in the colloidal medium. Um, and in the case of the little pieces of, of uh, magnetite, um, they don't clump together. So they are, they're evenly dispersed. They don't fall to the bottom and they don't clump together. So. A lot of people have asked me about that, and so that is why when you put a magnet there, uh, something happens, and when you take the magnet away, it goes back to its dispersed um, situation. So now let's talk about the surfactant, okay? Surfactants are compounds that lower the surface tension or the inter interfacial tension. Okay, that's more important because when you think of surface tension, usually you think of water and air, the interface between water and air. But um, uh, you really what we're looking at is between two surfaces of two different mediums, okay? So between two, it can be between two liquids, between a gas and a liquid, or between a liquid and a solid. And that's what we're talking about here with the little bits of magnetite in a liquid. So we're looking at the interface between the liquid and the solid, okay? Surfactants may act as detergents, wetting agents, emulsifiers, foaming agents, and dispersants, dispersants. So the uh, this, uh, surfactants, what they coat the surface of the magnetite with, causes the magnetite pieces, I, I assume, to repel each other, or at least they don't attract each other, and that keeps them uh, far, you know, evenly dispersed throughout the material. So that is why um, the ferrofluid, why the uh, magnetite pieces in the ferrofluid don't clump together. They, they remain dispersed. Okay, so let's talk about how the ferrocell works because <clears throat> when there's no magnet there, okay, let's go back a bit. When there's no magnet there, you, nothing happens, uh, you just get a dispersion of light. And when there is a magnet there, you get um, the light um, following these lines. Okay, so let's go back and uh, to this slide. Okay, so how does it work? And I'll just read this, this is uh, from the paper. The nanoparticles create a structure very similar to a diffraction grating, which is why I wanted you to watch those videos. 
okay, from the influence of the orientation of a, magnet, a, a magnetic field. The light diffracted by the ferrofluid, by the ferrofluid grating, seems to follow isopotential lines of the scalar field. Having the light source as the origin of light line because each diffraction line is perpendicular to the scatterer. So the diffraction lines are perpendicular to this, these lines. Okay, so this is uh, figure eight of the paper, observing the needle-like structures of ferrofluids using an optical microscope magnification 2500. Okay, so these this is the way the structures form in the presence of the magnetic field. So you get diffraction when you have a needle and you don't even have to have the slits, you don't need those walls, okay? But uh, here you can see this diffraction grating. Uh, this could easily act as, as a diffraction grating as we um, saw in, those, in the videos that I asked you to watch. So what are isopotential lines? Okay, iso means equal. And so isopotential lines are equal, equal potential lines. Equal potential lines are like contour lines on a map which trace lines of equal altitude. So we're talking about a contour map here. In this case, the altitude is the electrical potential or voltage. Equipotential lines are always perpendicular to the electric field. In three dimensions, the lines form equipotential surfaces. Movement along the equipotential surface requires no work because such movement is always perpendicular to the electric field. So here's a picture of an electric field. Okay, this is a point charge. And um, the electric field is normally um, thought of as these lines. The radial lines are the electric field and the electropotential lines, the electropotential lines are these dashed lines. So in a, in a straight electric field, when the electric field is, is linear like this, the equipotential lines are orthogonal. So it's trivial in this case to see how the equipotential lines are orthogonal to, um, to the, line, the electric field lines. Okay, when you have a point charge, okay, you can see that the equipotential lines go in circles around the point charge. And in the electric dipole um, case, it's a little more complicated. But as you can see, at every point, at every point of crossing, the equipotential lines are orthogonal to the um, to the electric charge or the lines of electric force. And so this is. Um, this is what equipotential lines are, or isopotential lines, as uh, Tim Vanderelli wants to call it. Okay. So, uh, and of course, you will recognize these two images as the famous Steinmetz picture that I have in, shown in many of my videos. Okay. So now um, the question becomes: Why do the lines form the way they do? under the ferrocell. Okay, why do they uh, curve as they are curving? And why do they cross over each other to form this hypotrochoid pattern uh, of the North Pole and uh, the pattern that we see here, which is actually, this is the dielectric inertial plane here. And so I'm just gonna read this and then we can talk about it. Uh, this is figure two in the paper. So, Image, this is an image of the magnetic contours obtained for a single cylinder magnet in two orthogonal planes using the ferro lens. Okay, in A, the polar configuration is presented and in B, the dipolar configuration is presented. Okay, the diagram of the magnetic field generated by this magnet is presented in C. So this is just a schematic. Uh, you can see um, the tor shape here. Okay, in the, in, in the hypertrochoid um, or the, uh, the hypergeometry, the um, inverse to the torus geometry here, 
but in fact this is actually another torus you can see that it could this is just um, the torus is cut out of this picture just for the sake of the schematic you can imagine that um, this torus is starting from the middle and expanding out so this would be um, like radiation the torus is radiating out and um, so this is you know just a schematic of what um, of how the these two projections are made okay so so again the question is why you know why do why do why does the ferrocell make this pattern on this plane and this pattern on this plane and the conclusion that Tim and his team came up with is that it's solely dependent on the placement of the lights. And so when you place the lights in a different configuration, you get a completely different pattern. So in this case, they're using a, a linear set of LEDs. Okay, instead of putting them in a circle, they're putting them in a line. And you see that now these are the patterns that the light is making. Okay, this is the North Pole or South Pole and this is the dipole uh, projection. And you can see, one thing that I see really interesting here is in these configurations, the lines don't cross each other like they do in these, uh, other, this other configuration. Okay, the lines do not cross. And so, and in this bottom one here, the, uh, the lights are placed uh, far away from the magnet. They're, they're down here somewhere. And so you can see that this is creating even a different pattern. Uh, and again, the lines don't cross. So uh, this is, you know, very interesting, a very important part of the picture that we're trying to, um, or the story that we're trying to tell about the ferro cell. So here is uh, an interesting figure from their paper. Okay, so this is uh, one light source. This is actually laser light. This is laser light um, pointing towards you from, from behind the ferro cell uh, towards you, towards us. And the magnet is over here. And so you can see that the light here, the light is doing two things as they're pointing out in this schematic over here. The laser spot is here and the laser coherent part of the light is making this line and the incoherent light that gets scattered because laser light is not perfectly coherent, um, it's columnated and, and made coherent, but when it enters the, the ferro cell, some of the light becomes decoherent, and then you get this uh, line here, this curve here. And uh, so this is really, this is just one light, and this is the pattern that it makes. Now, if this was just an LED, it would only make this line, this curved line, and it would not make this line. This line here is from the coherent part of the light, and this line here is from the incoherent part of the light. So now, now we have a really good piece of the puzzle here. Now we can answer the question, why do we get the hypertrochoid pattern uh, in the ferro cell? Because if I take this light and move it over here, I'm going to get a different circle. And if I move it over here and here, I'm going to get a different um, ellipsoid pattern. And so here, I just over took that picture from before and overlaid it and turned it a little bit to um, show that, a, say, a, a light source here would create this line, and a light source here would create this curve, and a light source here would create a different curve. And you can tell, you can now you can see that if I go all the way around, I'm going to get this hypertrochoid pattern. And you can see the because these lines are different colors, it's easy to see that you know you're getting these um, you know these kinds of orbits. The light is basically orbiting around the um, magnet, and you're getting this pattern here. So that's kind of neat. Uh, again, I'm going to show this schematically. If I took a light source here, I get this pattern. If I take the light source here, I get this pattern. If I take the light source here, I get this pattern. 
And if I go all the way around, I get exactly the hypertrochoid pattern that we see in the ferrocell. So this is a really important point. What we see under the ferrocell is completely dependent on the light source, 100% dependent on the light source. So this is not the field geometry of the magnet. This is the field, this is not even a field geometry really necessarily. It is um, how the light, uh, the, how the light reacts to the magnet depending on where it is. Okay, so this again, I just want to point this out again. I want to show you this picture um, because I want you to see, here's something that they show in, in, in their paper and I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, this is just um, to show that these kind of patterns also appear in nature. And if you look up perihelic circles, you'll see these kind of patterns um, appearing in nature. And I'm not going to get into the details of that. It has something to do with the water molecules in the air or the ice crystals in the air. And uh, there's a group from Brazil working on that, and they are um, also authors on this paper. So what is the actual field geometry surrounding a magnet? Um, this is not the field geometry because this is basically an optical illusion. It is literally an optical illusion because we're dealing with optics here. We've got glass, we've got light, we've got the ferrofluid uh, in between um, acting on uh, as a diffraction grating. Uh, so there's a lot of other things going on um, in the ferro lens. And so this is a clue as to what the actual field geometry around the magnet is, but this is not the field geometry directly. So what is the actual field geometry around a magnet? This, this is um, the actual isopotential lines. Okay, I, th I believe what the ferrocell is trying to show us, but because of the, all of the optical uh, issues with the diffraction grating and the position of the light, um, it is only sort of approximating the, um, the, these isopotential lines. The actual isopotential lines are much simpler and they don't cross over each other. And so Tim Vanderelli and his, um, his uh, colleague, Mike Snyder, wrote software they figured out the math. It's basically Maxwell's equations, right? It's a variation of Maxwell's equations. I don't have the details yet, but they wrote software to um, calculate the isopotential lines around the magnet. And uh, so this is in reality what the ferrocell is trying to tell us, I believe. And when you take the iron filings and you, you merge them, place them uh, in, show them with the isopotential lines, you see that they are exactly orthogonal to these isopotential lines. So the iron filings are showing us exactly what is orthogonal to the isopotential lines. And, and the ferrofluid in the ferrocell is actually uh, creating these isopotential lines um, by reflecting and refracting and diffracting um, through the material, through the diffraction grating to give us the pattern you see in the ferro cell. So you can see that the isopotential lines are really what we're looking for. So here is the polar um, configuration. And uh, so their software, when you put a North Pole and a South Pole um, into their software, this is the pattern it generates. These are the isopotential lines, the equal potential lines. And when you um, merge that with the iron filings, you see that they're at every point in the isopotential line. You can see that there is a I, you know, iron filing line looks exactly orthogonal to the isopotential lines. So this is extremely important. This is extremely important. This, I believe, is the missing secret of magnetism. This, this is really what magnetism is all about. I don't even think the iron filings are as important as these isopotential lines, right? I think these isopotential lines are very important because what you see here now is a gradient. 
a gradient. And if you remember, Science Asylum guy made a video on gradients, and he said everything that has a force, everything like the gravitational field or gravitational force um, ha can be modeled as a gradient. And now we can see the gradient. I can see it. And this is really great. Okay, so um, the equal isopotential lines. Now this is basically mimicking the equal and isopotential lines of the point charge. It's exactly, exactly the same. Okay, and you can see when you put the iron filings on, you get exactly this picture. Okay, same with the uh, dipole uh, configuration. Okay, the electric dipole looks like this. And when you put the iron filings into the picture, you get exactly the electric dipole um, picture. So um, there's one other thing I want to point out here in this um, explanation of the equipotential lines. They say movement along an equipotential surface requires no work because such movement is always perpendicular to the field, to the electric field, okay? The, these are, for all intents and purposes, orbits, okay? Orbit, an orbit does not require any work. It doesn't require, require any work for the Earth to orbit the Sun because it is following an equal potential line for all intents and purposes, okay? So these, are, these can be thought of as orbits. And they talk about that, uh, I think, in this paper, or it might be another paper, I might be uh, uh, misremembering that, but uh, this, you know, for all, is for all intents and purposes an orbit. Okay, so um, this looked really familiar to me. This looked really familiar to me, and I did a little bit of digging, and then I, it finally occurred to me what this is. Okay, see what I'm, see what you're, are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing here? Let's do that again. Okay, these are the orbitals of the probability distributions, distributions of the electron in the atom. Okay, so I'm just going to do that one more time because it's kind of fun. Okay, so what we're seeing here what we're seeing here, I believe, is a depiction of the orbitals, electron orbitals, around, or th there's an analogy here. Of course, there's an analogy here between the isopotential lines that um, we're calculating, that, that Tim and Mike are calculating around a magnet, and the um, probability distributions of electrons orbiting the atom. Okay, so um, the d orbital can be modeled with this configuration of magnets. So if you have north, south, south, north, you get the same pattern exactly of the 3d orbital. If you place the magnets in this configuration, you get the f orbital, the 4f. Okay, so here's all here's a bunch of them. I don't know if it's all of them, but it's a bunch of them. Um, so so far we've seen this one, this one, this one, and this one. Now I'm going to do this one. Okay, there we go. There's the 3p. If you take the magnets and put them in this configuration, now in order to me, in order for me to match this more accurately, I had to make the inner magnets 1.618 times smaller than the big magnet. And when I did that, I got the picture that I I felt was closer mapped to this picture here. Okay. So this magnet in this magnet, this, this magnet is 1.618 times bigger than this magnet. There's a phi relationship in here. And so um, this is something I thought was really interesting. 
Okay. Now I'm going to do this one. And there we go. And again, I did a 1.618, uh, a phi relationship between the inner and outer magnets, and I get exactly this image. Very, very close. Like there's, it's freakishly similar. So uh, I could go on. I could go on and do the rest of these, but I, I know that they're going to work. Okay, I know they're going to work um, because there's, there's a couple of things going on here. So, but the big question I have is, what is this telling us? What is this telling us? I know what it's telling me, and I know this is something I suspected for a long time. And, uh, and this is really just confirmation of what I, what I originally thought um, in understanding the missing secrets of magnetism. Okay, what is, what is the missing secret of magnetism? Well, I think the missing secret of magnetism is that the magnet is, for all intents and purposes, an atom. Okay, the magnet is, for all intents and purposes, an atom. And why am I saying that? Because, okay, here's what I think is going on. When you make a magnet coherent, what is going on? What is going on is you're taking all the inner atomics, the atoms within the, um, the material, the iron, and you are making them coherent. What does that mean? Well, you are lining up the domains. You're lining up all the magnets, not all of them, but a good number of them. Uh, the, more, the more magnets you line up, the more iron atoms that you line up, the stronger the magnet's going to be. And that's why, like the neodymium magnets, the very strong ones, they take a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to line up all those atoms and, and make the, um, the atoms coherent with each other. So why does that make the magnet an atom? Well, here's an analogy. I'm going to make an analogy. If you took a bunch of spinning cylinders, if you took a bun bunch of spinning uh, gyroscopes and spun them under underwater and you oriented them all in the same direction, okay, the uh, gyroscopes are going to start spinning the water. Just like that cylinder um, experiment that I showed you when they spin the cylinders, that the cylinders begin to behave like magnets. So if you took a bunch of cylinders, like a whole bunch of them, and put them underwater and oriented them all in the same direction and spun them all, what's going to happen is eventually the bulk of the water is going to begin to spin. The bulk of the water, the big, the water that surrounds, that encompasses all of the may all of these cylinders is going to start to spin and why you ask it's called conservation of angular momentum it actually takes less energy to spin the bulk of the water as it does to spin all the tiny magnets all the tiny magnets are going to with all the pressure mediation and everything going on in there uh, eventually, uh, the whole bulk of the water is going to begin to spin. It's going to begin to spin. And so I think that is what's going on with the magnet. When you take all the little tiny magnets, which are the atoms in the material, the magnetic material, bef you know, before it's magnetized, all of the atoms are oriented differently. And after magnetization, a great number of them are oriented in the same direction and therefore the bulk of the medium the bulk of the ether the bulk of the whatever it is that's spinning on the small scale is spinning is going to be spinning at the large scale and so one magnet is going to behave like each of the little tiny magnets and so it's, it's kind of like raising it up you're raising up the atomic behavior you're raising it up to the larger scale in the fractal paradigm this makes sense this might not make sense to 
someone that doesn't understand the fractal, fractal paradigm. But in the fractal paradigm, this makes sense. You can see the fractal paradigm going on here. So here you, see, you have this pattern, and here you have this pattern with this in the middle, and here you have this pattern with this in the middle. Okay, these are the, the orbitals. These are the uh, probability distributions of the electrons around, around um, the atoms. And so, um, actually, that's all. I'm going to leave it at that for now. This is a lot to take in all at once. I just wanted to give you um, my um, perspective on why these patterns uh, form with the isopotential line algorithm that Tim and that Tim Vanderelli and Mike Schneider developed. Um, this is a huge breakthrough as far as I'm concerned. At least it's a breakthrough for me because now I have a really great understanding of magnetism. I have a much better understanding of what it is and where it comes from and why it exists and, and, and where the fractal paradigm fits in uh, than I did before. So I hope you enjoy this video and uh, I might not have to make any more videos because I think this is really the missing secret of magnetism. <laughs>